So it's a great pleasure to be here, and thanks very much to Munzer and Ali and everybody involved. Um, so I'm going to say a few words about what's new in data. Just making sure this is advancing. Um, so I, I, you know, one one thing to stress is is what's new about the data that we have available today, and how do how does it compare to the way that we used to collect data especially in social sciences. And here I just put down you know, sort of old style. You can think of this as going back to Malinowski and uh, Simmel and other people who were collecting data a century ago. Um, anthropology, sociology, development economics, field work where essentially it's subjective. You know, there's a, a scientist who goes out, observes something or surveys people, asks them questions, and indirectly observes what's going on. Um, it's something that was designed, so we had an idea of we want to answer a question, this is how we're going to answer it. Uh, it was hard to get dynamics because you're, you're in the field for a short period of time, you're observing things, but you can't be there forever, you can't observe everybody at the same time. Um, but you, what you can do is you're seeing a, essentially a whole society, so you can map out a, a, a complete society. And that, that we can think of as sort of an old style. The new style, um, the, the things that John was talking about, and we've seen other instances, you know, social media, large scale, um, easy to collect. It's objective in the sense that we're actually observing people's real communication. We're observing their emails. We're observing their calls. We can see the language that's used. Um, so we have objective data. Uh, it's incidental. So this is something where the data happened to be collected for other reasons, and us as scientists, we can, we can see that data, but we didn't design the data collection ourselves. We're, we're sort of making use of it because it's there. Um, but it gives us much finer resolution. We can see things on a, on a minute by, by minute basis, sometimes even second by second. Um, but there's also a challenge that we might see one piece of it as opposed to many pieces. So I. You know, the people I talk with uh, via email are different people than I talk to on the phone. These are different people than I communicate with on Facebook, different people on LinkedIn. Um, so if you start putting all these things together, you, you get a very different picture depending on which particular data set you might have access to. And that can make it more difficult to actually be sure that we're, we're really tracking information or we're tracking communication because people can be shifting between different sources at, at different points in time. Okay, let me just sort of I'll go through a couple of examples. And one thing to say is that, you know, although the, the growth of new data is coming through technology, technology is also advancing our ability to do old style data collection. So I'll, I'll sort of show you a picture. This is from work I've been doing for actually for a decade now with Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo, and Arun Chandra Sikar. So a team at MIT, a team at Stanford. We've been collecting data in Karnataka, rural villages in India. We have about 70,000 interviews, and those interviews could not have been done, and this research could not have been done without modern technology in the sense of the, the number of tablets they had, the teams, the way they were trained, going into the field, getting large numbers of interviews. Um, so we were able to do this on a scale that we couldn't have done it bef before. And we were able to get 75 different villages, essentially complete census of these villages. And, and using that, then we're able to, to begin to look at things. And this is just a map of, of the network between households and borrowing kerosene and rice in, in one of these villages. And so that gives us a picture, um, just to coordinate with, with John, um, a, a Facebook picture as well. You know, this is very different scale, right? So, so the advantages to this are that you can be, we can be tracking things um, thousands of miles away, people interacting uh, second by second, you know, for instance, an interesting study recently done with Facebook data by Mike, uh, so Bailey, Cow, um, uh, Kukler, and Strobel. They've been looking at how prices of houses in one city affect people's investment of whether they buy a house in another city. So for instance, if I see my friend buy a house in New York, I begin to think that that's a good investment for me in Palo Alto. Maybe that's not a good, you know, they're almost uncorrelated, but people are still reacting. So you're seeing those kinds of effects, and they can trace, uh, trace that through Facebook. Um, in, in this study, we were able to trace things about microfinance decisions. We were looking at whether people took out loans and whether or how that depended on who they were connected to in a network and what information they were getting. And that's something that you couldn't necessarily trace through Facebook. I don't pay, so, uh, you know, 
on Facebook, I don't post which credit card I'm using or whether I took out a loan today. Um, I might say, look, I bought a house, and that's something you can observe, or uh, you know, I'm, I just rented a new house. So these kinds of certain kinds of things you can get from one type of data, certain kinds of things you can get from different types of data, and so they'll still be complementary, but technology is enhancing our ability to collect and to work with these models and, uh, both at the same time. So I just wanted to emphasize sort of the differences between these incidental generated data sets and, and ones that we could actually collect. Um, one other point I want to make, um, and, th and this fits, I think, a bit with what uh, John was saying and actually Munzer was saying this morning, there's feedback effects in these networks. And that's something which is, I think, really important to understand. And it's changing our world. So the way we're communicating is changing our world. The way markets are evolving is changing our world. And we know very little about that. And so let me just show you um, one thing that came out of the study with Abhijit, um, Arun, and, and Esther. And uh, wow, the, the colors didn't come out on this. But the, so uh, they should be uh, blues and reds. But um, you could, I, could, I can sort of fill in the gaps here. So um, what, what happened in, out of the villages we were looking at, some of these villages were exposed to microfinance, small loans. Some villages were not. So we have a set of villages that got loans, a set of villages that didn't. And we looked at the networks before the, the microfinance was, was there and then after the microfinance was there. So markets come in, suddenly people have exposure to markets. What happens to the networks? Do we change the way that we interact with people? And so we have a set of villages which are not getting the loans and one that are. And so the no, no MF is the no microfinance villages, the MF are the microfinance villages. And the, the bars to the left are the before pictures. So basically, how dense are these networks? How many people are people connected with on, on average? So you've got a certain rate of connections. It's, it's more or less the same in the microfinance and non-microfinance villages before. Then six years later, we went back. We remapped the networks. Um, one thing you're seeing in this part of India, this is uh, in Karnataka, it's around Bangalore, you're tending to see erosion of networks to begin with. So the networks are, are, are eroding, and you're seeing a, a lower density already. Some people are moving out of the, the villages. You're seeing the social structure. If you look at Putnam's bowling alone, you're seeing some of that go on there. But what you're seeing actually in the microfinance villages is that doubled. So the drop in density was actually twice as much in the microfinance villages, the villages that got access to loans, than it was in the non-ones. So the fact that we're coming in with these markets is changing the social structure. And those social structures are eroding faster the, the more exposure you had to markets. And if you look here, um, this is actually mapping it out depending on sort of what the probability was that somebody would take out a loan. So we can look at you know, people who are wealthy, more educated, wealthier. These are all poor people in these villages. But wealthier people who are more educated or low, uh, lower income, less educated people. And the people who are, are, are losing the most are actually the people who are less, least likely to get the loans. So there's actually external effects here. So the, the, the money's coming in. It's rewiring the networks. It's replacing some of the network that used to go on. But it's happening. It's have, having external effects. And the people who are least likely to get the money are most likely to be losing the, the social structure. So these are kinds of things that we really need to understand, something that's sort of important in understanding design of any system, how it's going to affect things. Um, one thing I want to say, sort of say about this, you know, we're, we're being inundated with data. Uh, the data can wag the dog. Um, what does that mean? That means that you know, a lot of times now the data comes first. A, a student appears at a door. I've got this great data set. What do I do with it? Uh, well, by, by looking at what to do with data, we, we're going to have problems in the sense that we're putting the data first and, not, and the theory second. And this is something that Mike Alvarez was talking about. What's the role of theory? The theory should be in guiding us as to which questions to ask. And we want to make sure that we stick with a scientific method as, we, as we're faced with more data. So as scientists, what's the question we want to answer and which data should we be getting rather than here's some great data, what does it tell me? Because then we're likely to sort of, it's a sort of the distracted finance literature. Um, Big data came along in the 1960s in finance, and it distracted the scientific literature for quite a while there. You, you had the studies of the Monday effect, the value effect, the January effect, the equity premium puzzle, a whole series of things that really were sort of 
uh, empirical curiosities and anomalies that weren't really deep scientific questions and sort of distracted the literature for a while. So you want to make sure that we don't get stuck on, wow, this is really interesting, um, but, but what should we be looking for? Um, so just in terms of summary, opportunities and challenges, you know, the, the, there's differences between direct and indirect observation of data. Um, one thing I want to sort of say uh, in terms of you know, how markets are, are, and technology are, are driving social structure, that's something that should be uh, really at the forefront. And just to close, um, I think the biggest challenge that we face is something that's been mentioned a couple of times today, replication. And, and Mike Alvarez talked about that in terms of journals requiring replication. But one thing I think that's really important with private data sources is that we're also getting censorship. And what does that mean? That means that you know, suppose that I, I was going to a social media platform that, say, is, is in business networking. And I want to ask the uh, question, is this improving employment in the US? Well, um, if the answer turns out to be yes, they'll let me publish it. If the answer turns out to be no, they probably won't let me publish it. Um, that's a problem for science, right? So, so reputations can get in the way of, of the science if the, if the data is being collected privately. And so there's not only a question of access to the data, but there's also a question of which data eventually get released in terms of the studies that are being done. And so I think you know, we have a lot to, there's a, a, enormous opportunities um, and also enormous challenges uh, that come along with this. And I should stop at this point, thanks. <laughs>